thank you all. And we're going to continue on with our briefing to keep things moving. Our next uh, speaker is uh, from HHS, Department of Health and Human Services, and she's the director uh, for, uh, for Medicaid services over at HHS. And so we're very pleased to have uh, Cindy Mann with us. Cindy? Bright lights. And they give you a platform, but it's kind of got things on it that you can't put your things on. Good morning, everybody. It is really good to be here, um, juggling my book here. Um, and lots of, uh, lots of familiar faces, good friends, and um, some new folks to meet. So um, it's quite a crowd. I'm very impressed by all of you getting here today. And, um, and I'm really thrilled to be part of the discussion. Um, as, um, as noted, I am Deputy Administrator at CMS, and I'm the Director of the Center for Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program. Um, and uh, we're kind of busy these days over in, in Medicaid. Um, and, um, you know, I'm really eager to talk with you today, tell you a little bit about what we're doing, what some of the pressures we're seeing, what some of the actions we're taking, but also make sure that we have time so that I can hear your, um, your comments, your concerns, your questions, because hopefully what you'll gather, um, if for no, uh, nothing else from my few minutes together with you today, is the just enormously strong commitment that we at CMS and that this administration has for moving forward in terms of making the Medicaid program the strongest program it can be for people with disabilities and particularly making sure that no one, no one ever has to um, uh, um, decide how to get health care coverage based on um, where, they, where they get those services and how those services are delivered, but that people get them in the most integrated setting and in a way that respects their, their independence and their dignity. Um, you know probably uh, as well as anybody in the country how important the Medicaid program is. There really is no health care program that's more attuned to meeting the needs of people with disabilities than the Medicaid program. And you also know, um, I assume, that some would like to end the program. They'd like to cap it, say let's save money by just not spending the money. Um, or take away individual protections that people have uh, within the Medicaid program. Um, we want to strengthen the program. We want to make it the best program it can be. We are, uh, we are acutely aware that there are problems uh, structurally in the program as well as how it delivers, but it has the promise and the capacity and the history of, of providing care for people with disabilities like, uh, like no other program. Um, and so we, uh, we welcome your partnership in um, not only keeping it alive, but um, making it a strong program. We have lots of new provisions in the Affordable Care Act to implement, some that have a particular focus on for care for people with disabilities and specifically on long-term care that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, we are trying to take every opportunity, um, both the, the, looking at the new provisions in the ACA as well as looking at other flexibilities and opportunities in the Medicaid program uh, to move forward on assuring home and community-based services are available to everyone who needs them and that they're provided in a way that fully promotes independence and integration in the community. There are lots of changes going on in the marketplace, including extending long-term care and, um, into managed care and improving integration of care for those who are eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. These present great opportunities, but we all know they also present considerable challenges to us all. Some are driven, we are, we're, you know, we're all aware of the state fiscal crisis going on around the country. Some are driven by the desire to save money. Um, the, the challenge for us as we move forward is to make sure that we are using these opportunities to improve care. We know things aren't working perfectly now, so we, we want to embrace change, but want to embrace change in a way that always puts people at the center, that always sees that our goal is improvements in care. Um, so let me talk a little bit about what we've been um, uh, dealing with, both in terms of responding to and then affirmatively uh, working on. 
Lots of uh, activity, of course, I know that you all work on locally as well as nationally responding to fiscal pressures. Um, in the Medicaid program, you, Medicaid is on the front burner of every newspaper during state budget time, and these days state budget time is probably 12 months out of the year for most states. Um, and so what we've seen is over the last couple of years, families and children enrollment in the Medicaid program has grown because of the recession, and that's the way Medicaid is supposed to be, right? It's supposed to be a counter-cyclical program when more people are in need, then more people apply and the program uh, expands. That's the intention. But of course, during a downturn, that expansion of enrollment comes exactly at a time when states have less money. So the federal government did step in and through the Recovery Act provided increased federal matching payments to help deal with that boost in enrollment. Those matching payments, those increased matching payments, as I'm sure many of you know, ran out um, earlier, uh, earlier last or mid last year. And so what we've seen is, is even more intense focus on what's going on in state budgets in Medicaid as the enrollment still hasn't declined because the effects of the economic downturn are still being felt. Um, and yet the extra boost from the federal dollars was no longer available. So lots of attention on the Medicaid budget. Um, it, while enrollment growth explains the recent growth in the costs, the real drivers, as you well know, are elsewhere. Um, and so really digging di in on those other drivers of costs are, I think, where the attention is, is turning. Uh, Medicaid, uh, you know, it's a, it's a familiar story and you all know it, is that 5% um, of, of the folks enrolled in the Medicaid program account for about 54% of all the spending. And long-term care expenditures are the biggest uh, factor in, in, in the spending. So we have seen increasing focus on some long-term care activities at the federal level and at the state level. Some of the increased focus from the state level and, um, and, and some proposals at the federal level are simply to cut, right? Cut benefits, cut rates, just cut, okay? That is, um, as, as my uh, former boss, former administrator Don Berwick would say, is maybe the easy way to get out of a state pro fiscal problem, but it's not the right way. Uh, we need to be smart, we need to be thoughtful, we need to think about transformation of health care. It's harder. It doesn't happen overnight, uh, but at the end, what I think we're after and what our mission is, is to improve health, improve health care, and through those improvements, um, find ways to lower costs, which we're confident there are ways to do that through, through care improvements. So, um, so we see a lot of changes going on, a lot of them around transformation of long-term care services and support, a lot of movement towards integration of acute care and long-term care, and a lot of move, uh, moving forward around uh, putting long-term care services under uh, managed care uh, settings. Again, these are opportunities and these are challenges, and our goal throughout all of this transformation is to work very closely with partners to hear from you what you think is going on, to hear from you as to how you think we can best improve the system, and to always focus on those three-part goals, which is better health, better health care, and, and lowering costs through improvements. So let me talk a little bit about some of the particular tools that are in the Affordable Care Act that we've been working on, and I know you're very interested and have been focused on um, for the last couple of years. Um, the three I'm going to talk about um, uh, are the new health home provision for people with chronic conditions, community first choice, and balancing incentive programs. So let me just briefly talk about health homes. For um, uh, It's a new option in the Affordable Care Act. It gives states extra federal dollars, extra match, 90% match for care coordination when they um, set up health homes um, bigger than medical homes, and they have to fully integrate behavioral health, physical health, long-term care, and acute care. Um, uh, uh, and and uh, they can, uh, a state under the, under the option, can set up health homes generally in the state for people with chronic conditions and disabilities, or they can target 
the health home for people with particular disabilities, particular um, uh, chronic conditions. And um, we have states actually doing both. Some of them are, most of them are starting um, by, by some more targeting and then moving forward. The, what the law allows is the state gets an enhanced match, 90% of the cost of the care coordination is picked up by the federal government for eight quarters um, for that particular targeted set of health homes. So if a state does, for example, a set of health homes around uh, people with um, serious mental illness, they'll get eight quarters of the enhanced match for that uh, initiative and then regular match continuing. Um, and then later if it decides to focus on, on uh, people with other conditions and disabilities, it would get another eight quarters of 90% match. So part of what, what our challenges are, I think, as we move forward on some of these system transformations is we want, you know, everybody wants to move quickly. Quickly is a good thing. On the, on the other hand, too quickly is not a good thing because we want to make sure that the supports and the care is really there for people in the community. So, um, so it's important to recognize that the health home option is out there, but the clock isn't ticking, meaning if a state is planning and you're working with your state and your community on how to develop a really strong health home, um, there's no time limit. You can come in later and, and get that enhanced 90% match. The community first choice option I know is something that's very important to all of you and something that's very important to all of us. Um, it's a new state option, meaning you don't have to get a waiver for it to offer attendant care and related supports in the community settings and very uh, specific opportunities for self-direction. Um, and it also, like uh, the health home, includes an extra um, federal boost of support, a 6% increased match rate on, on all the services provided for these attendant care and supports. The law became effective in October. We've been talking to states about implementation. We issued proposed regulations a while back, and we are in the process of finalizing those regulations and hope to have them soon. You know, we are, we are open for business for any state that wants to think about implementing community first choice so there's no delay in moving forward if states are ready to do so and we've been in conversations with, with a couple of different states on it and I'm going to get back to one of the big issues in CFC in a, in a minute. The third, um, the third initiative from the Affordable Care Act that I want to specifically mention, and of course there are many more that are of interest to everybody here, is the Balancing Incentives Program. It too was effective in October, this past October 2011, and it too provides uh, an enhanced federal support to increase diversions and in access to home and community-based service. The interesting thing about the Balancing Incentive Program is it explicitly targets the states that have done or, or that have the least um, uh, uh, investment in home and community-based services relative to institutional care. So the goal is to, uh, is to take the states that have um, made the least progress, frankly, and to help give them additional supports to move forward. It is a high bar. It is not an easy program to, for a state to jump in on, uh, but I'm very excited to, to say that we expect our um, uh, first approval of the first state under the balancing incentive programs to come uh, very soon and we're in discussions with a couple of states. Uh, we've been doing lots of work also on Money Follows the Person. We plan to have a new um, funding opportunity for Money Follows the Person coming forward. We're working on 1915C, K, I, all of those initials um, coming out. Uh, in terms of uh, both approvals and uh, reviews of, of state proposals as well as regulations. I do want to mention specifically an area that's been um, of much contention in terms of both our, our work in the communities and the with the states as well as our regulations, which is what constitutes a home and community setting. Um, it's an issue that's at, that's at play in all of our regulations. It's at play in our 1915C, Home and Community-Based Waiver Services Regulations, Community uh, First Regulations. We've, you know, went out and we've had stakeholder conversations for um, really now three years um, through various kinds of uh, uh, forums as well as regulations uh, that, that solicit public comments. And man, we've gotten a lot of public comments. <laughs> Um, just on communities, and well, mostly on community settings, we got more than 1,500 in 19, uh, for the 1915C regulation. Um, 
As you might not be surprised to hear, uh, there are varying views on what is a home and community-based setting. Um, there are varying views by stakeholders, individuals with disabilities, families, states, providers, advocacy groups. There are differences within the disability community. I don't need to tell you about that. There's lots of heated discussion and um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working on a lot of things around implementation of health reform, around, um, uh, uh, you know, providing um, mental health services to kids, um, thinking about mental health parity, thinking about the, a myriad of issues that, that are really tough. Um, I would say this community settings issue is probably ranks, you know, has to be, if not the toughest, um, certainly in the top five. Um, you know, the bottom line is we need more, more choices available for people. We want to, um, uh, there needs to be more resources in the community for, uh, for real home and community-based settings. We want to make sure that uh, people have the kinds of settings that really support them. What we're increasingly beginning to focus on, thanks to I think all of the insight from, from people um, in the community, is that the less, we should focus less on brick and mortar. Um, and more on what the experience is for people. I think that's very consistent with what the disability. Yeah. It's, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you can look at this or that and say, well, maybe this, and it's too high, it's too small, it's too big, it's too, you know. But what is the experience of individuals? You know, are they able to live independently? Is their experience such that they are integrated into the community to the maximum amount possible? So um, we will, you will see some new um, uh, um, guidance from us coming as a result of all the comments that we're sifting through and all the conversations that we've, been ha we've had. Um, and um, it's, it's never the end. It's always a continuing conversation. So we really want to continue to work with you. There's no, uh, no more important issue, I think, for all of us in this area. We are also continuing to work very closely with the Office of Civil Rights and HHS, with the Department of Justice. I know Tom Perez from uh, Civil Rights Division. Um, it was a close colleague of ours is coming to talk to you in a little bit. We're also increasingly, both Tom and I and others are working with HUD um, because we've got to get more housing out there for folks. Um, so there's lots of ways in which I think the federal government can be working in cooperation with each other, the different agencies and different partners, just as I encourage everybody in the disability community to be working together and with us on these difficult questions. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start to wrap up, but I can't um, talk to anybody without at least mentioning, of course, come 2014, we have a really big change in coverage. And while um, often it's, it's thought that, that these issues uh, and the changes in 2014 don't have a lot to do with people with disabilities, they in fact do, of course, um, in this country. Um, you can be low income, you can, be, you can have a disability, um, and you can still be ineligible for the Medicaid program. Um, and, at le and in 2014, everybody will be eligible um, uh, in Medicaid. All adults will be eligible up to 133% of poverty. And while it's often said that that's for you know, non elderly, non-disabled adults, that's, that's actually not true. It's for anybody who's non-elderly, it is true about the elderly, um, is for anybody with income below 133% of poverty. So if, if folks are living in a state that covers people in the Medicaid program only up to the SSI level, doesn't go above that, it's about 74% of the poverty level, might have a medically needy po program with spend down, the changes in 2014 will be enormous because people will get, be eligible if their income is below 133% of poverty. They won't necessarily be tested for disability, but we are trying to construct regulations, and we issued an NPRM last August um, that says um, get people into coverage and then do a deeper dive to make sure that they're getting the benefits that, um, to which they are eligible. So if somebody can get in based on income, they can get into the program quickly, and then there's a, what we refer to as our deeper dive. Um, you do the deeper dive to make sure you find out whether somebody has a disability or other uh, reason to make sure that they're getting the most appropriate uh, package of benefits for them. So I hope um, and I implore you all to be engaged in implementation of uh, these changes at, at your state level. Um, because how it's done 
will make an enormous difference as to whether we really have um, a, a smooth, seamless path to affordable coverage for so many more people. Um, and, um, and it's only going to work, of course, with, with people's direct involvement. So uh, let me just wrap up here and then be able to have some time to hear from you um, by saying this is clearly an unprecedented time um, to get change. Um, and the change that we want to see. We have a window of opportunity by virtue of all that's happening to capture the moment and to really make it our own and make it the best we possibly can. Uh, we can look for, for efficiencies in program design and development. We can really tackle um, the, the notion that care ought to be coordinated for people, that we ought to look at not this provider and this provider and this provider, but we ought to look at this person and make sure that the system works well for this person. That, I would commit to you, is our focus and our goal. Tell us always what we're doing right. Um, tell us always what we're doing wrong and help us lead so that we can go forward and be very proud of using this opportunity as, as best as we can. So thank you. Do people, uh, when people have a question or a comment, could you just identify yourself where you're from? Yeah, I'm Walt Baggett, uh, RPDC. I work for Mary Lou Mac Macarella. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's his claim to fame, huh? <laughs> I want to thank you, Cindy, for really demystifying a very complex uh, mm -hmm. CMS operations, uh, especially Medicaid. Uh, and it's very encouraging to hear you talk mm -hmm. about moving uh, long-term services into managed care. The question is, um, how will you assure that as you do that, uh, that uh, what you have will adhere to the requirements of ADA and Olmstead? You've already addressed that, I think, with your collaborations. Could you address that, please? Sure. Um, well, I think that um, there's lots of different ways that we're trying to work to make sure that ADA and Olmstead um, requirements are taking hold um, in the course of uh, approval or denials, and we have denied some waiver requests from states to provide home and community-based services in settings that we think do not meet the Olmstead and ADA requirements. Um, we, in these new regulations that, and conversations that we're all having about settings, I think in the context of managed care, what we're really looking for is um, is to try and um, uh, put into whether it's waiver documents or quality review protocols what we think uh, really are the most important things to have in place to make sure that we've got the protections and the guarantees that I think people are looking for. So we are very much looking for specific ideas it, um, uh, we've been working with our Office of Disability as well as OCR and DOJ to think about what very concrete things we can put into waiver terms and conditions, how we can monitor what's going on, how we can rely on the community um, to tell us um, what they're worried about, uh, what they want to see in there affirmatively, and then once something is implemented or starting to roll out, how well it's going, what are the problems, how can we jump on it together quickly? Um, we, uh, I apologize, but we need, we're a little bit behind schedule, and we have a couple of people coming. Um, and so I want to thank Cindy. Uh, I apologize, Cindy. But we, uh, The, the, I wanted to get our OMB person up here as well, and then, of course, you're going to have a breakout session with HHS, uh, I mean, not with HHS, on Medicaid with um, our senior advisor here at the uh, Office of Healthcare, uh, Carol, so you'll have a chance to ask more questions on that. So, But I want to make sure we don't fall too far behind um, and, and get to our next speaker, who is um, Robert Gordon, um, who works in the Office of Management and Budget and overseas, has uh, overseen a lot of the disability programs in the past and uh, has moved up the chain, so he's a great guy to hear from. So let me introduce uh, Robert Gordon. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, uh, great that you all are here today. Um, I'm going to try to not talk for too long so we can do questions, and I'm going to try to talk about two different things. One is um, 
some of our administration's record and priorities in making sure that all Americans can achieve their potential, particularly in the area of uh, education, which is an area that I've worked in for a long time. Um, and the other is to talk to you a little bit about the, the outlook this year, big picture, with um, uh, trying in a very difficult environment to, to sustain the good economic news that we've had to maintain job growth uh, and to reduce the deficit at the same time and some of the challenges that those will that doing both of those things will present for the priorities of a lot of people I know in this room. Um, so in the space of education, we have worked very hard in, in what has been a really difficult fiscal environment, really very hard, I think harder than any of us anticipated, to do what we can to help all Americans achieve their potential, and in particular, uh, to help individuals with disabilities. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what we've done to, to help families, help individuals address developmental challenges and, and achieve their full potential. One of our thoughts has been that you have to start as early as you possibly can. So uh, across the spectrum, we've worked very hard on early intervention. A program I worked very hard on was a home visiting program uh, to work with parents even before kids are born to make sure that they're getting a healthy start. We got $1.5 billion in the healthcare reform bill, something we're working closely with HHS to implement in a way that is um, sensitive to the evidence about what works and what will serve children's needs. Um, we've expanded early Head Start and Head Start programs. We've had a program called the Early Learning Challenge Fund, um, which was something the President talked about in his campaign. We didn't think we were going to get it at all. Uh, then we got $500 million for it last year. And in the context of that program, one of the things that we've asked states to do, it's a program focused on quality. Uh, is to make sure that children with special needs get the services that they need and to make sure that as states are building assessment systems, the systems have particular elements that are sensitive to and appropriate for children with disabilities. Uh, to invest in training for teachers, obviously. Teachers need to know what they're doing to serve children and to serve different kinds of children. So we've pushed states to do that. We have a handful of leading edge states that are moving forward on these fronts and we look forward to investing more in that challenge grant program. Um, special education and the IDEA program, one of the things that we've pushed for is expansions in IDEA Part C, serving the youngest children, making sure that children are getting the interventions that they need. We asked for a pretty big expansion last year. We, we only got a little bit of it, but we're glad that we were able to get that little bit. Uh, and we'll continue to, um, continue to ask for increases there. Um, race to the top is something that you know, it's probably our proudest accomplishment in the space of education. And um, one of the things that we did with the money is that we set aside about $70 million uh, to, uh, uh, for consortia of states to develop assessments for children with disabilities, in particular children with cognitive disabilities, to make sure that these, these children are not being set on the side, they're not being measured in ways that aren't appropriate, they're being asked and helped to achieve to their full potential. So we have two consortia of states, I think one has 18, one has 11, that are working together to develop those assessments. We're working with them. We're looking forward to the, the implementation of those plans. Um, last thing I'll talk about in, in the space of kids uh, is a program that I worked on a lot that um, uh, we're proud of and really excited that we were able to get some funding for which is a program that we call the SSI Promise Program. Um, um, thank you, sir. Um, um, so, um, you know, SSI is obviously a very critical program for, for millions of kids. It's, it's, it's part of the safety net uh, that ensures that children with disabilities are, obviously in most cases, they don't begin to get what they what they really need, but it gets them something. It helps to establish a floor. Um, very often SSI is off on the side, and too often you have programs operating in silos. You have school programs and health programs, and then you have SSI providing cash assistance. And one of the thoughts that we had was that we could work to integrate these better and create incentives for states to integrate the programs um, to make sure that they're working in a seamless way, to make sure that people in the health and social services side know what's going on in the education side and vice versa. Um, and 
even in a very difficult fiscal environment. It was something we asked Congress for last year, and we actually got some money to do it this year for planning grants. Uh, so we're very excited about this, something we would love to work with all of you on. The hope is that we can create a system that, while it maintains that floor, it's also helping people rise further up and it's helping kids to develop to their fullest. So that's something that we're excited about. Um, those are some high points from the education space. I know that um, time is limited and, and uh, I think we may have a, a, a special guest who will interrupt me. Um, so um, let me just turn a little bit and talk about the bigger budget picture uh, and then would love to take your questions. Um, this has been, as I said, a very challenging time. And what we're trying to do now, uh, I think, is, is three big things for this year uh, in the budget process. And they're things that will affect the programs that I know all of you care about. The first is maintain the momentum on job creation. Uh, and we continue to ask for significant resources to help people, to help create jobs, to maintain the payroll tax cut, to maintain the expansion of unemployment insurance, to do things like help keep teachers from getting laid off. Um, that's something that we think is really very, very important. Um, the economy's finally turning in the right direction. We have to keep that going. Um, the, second, um, the second thing that we think uh, is really important is to continue reducing the deficit. Um, we're proud that we've achieved about $2 trillion in deficit reduction in the last year. Um, uh, thank you. Um, uh, it wasn't easy. Um, but um, we think there's more that has to be done. And we think it has to be done in a balanced way. What we did in the last year is impose significant limits on what's called discretionary spending, the spending that Congress does every year. And that's where money for basically all of the programs that I talked about earlier, that's where the money for those programs comes from. Our view is that now it's time to look to other parts of the budget, to look to getting increased revenues, making sure that people at the very top pay their fair share, uh, to look to some smart, to look to smart, appropriate, uh, limited, tailored reductions in Medicare, uh, in Medicaid. Um, and then also to look across the federal budget to scour other programs that too often have just sort of been left on the side and to achieve reductions in those programs. And the reason I mention all these things and why I think they're important, and I guess the last thing that I'll say to you that I hope we feel urgency about and I hope you will feel urgency about, um, if we don't find a way in the next year to get reductions in all these other areas and to get at least $1.2 trillion in reductions in these areas. In fact, if, if Congress doesn't act, what will happen is there will be what's called the sequester. There will be a mandatory set of reductions in the federal budget. And those reductions will fall in the areas where we've already cut. Uh, so you will see in, in, in the spaces where we've achieved the $2 trillion in savings in education, in health and social services programs, you'd see another round of cuts. We do not want those additional cuts to happen. Uh, we want them to be replaced with a more balanced package of cuts. So I think you'll hear a lot about that. And I think it's really critical for programs I know all of you care about that we actually get that done. So uh, I'm going to stop now because I, uh, uh, I see my old boss. <laughs> so um, we'll see, um, hopefully. We'll see, if, um, we'll see if Robert can stick around for maybe for some, for, for some Q&A. We'll see how the time works. Um, but we have a special guest, so we wanted to go ahead and do that right now. Uh, so please welcome the newest chief of staff to the White House, uh, Jack Lou. Jack. Uh, good morning, and uh, I'm let me join in welcoming you here to the White House. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you, and uh, it's a pleasure to follow my friend Robert Gordon, who I'm sure gave you uh, a lot of details on things that are going on. Um, you know, I, I come to you uh, with a personal understanding of how important the issues that you work on. Um, I've uh, confronted uh, the issues of people with disabilities uh, in my family, in my community, and um, it is an issue that is 
always been very important to me, not just that we treat people with disabilities with respect, but that we do the kinds of things that make it possible for people to live in their communities, have productive lives, and to be a part of the community. So I applaud the work that you do, and it's something that matters to me both personally and professionally. Um, in the Clinton administration, I was proud to work on things like Ticket to Work. Uh, I think we, we have in the Obama administration tried to both through legislation and through the things we do administratively, make sure that we're able to take the programs we have and find ways to be more successful, to do the pilots that can demonstrate the things that can work better in the future, to get things set up so that they work. Um, I come into the new role as Chief of Staff, uh, you know, bringing the values that I've just described with me, and I look forward going uh, on to being a partner with all of you. Um, I, I think it's important in this, as in so many other areas, uh, we can't just wait until our political process produces results. We have to, as the executive branch, look inside and ask what can we do with the authorities we have, what can we do with the programs we have to do more, to do better, and to lay the foundation uh, for these programs working to help people uh, in the future. Um, one of the things about these sessions that's important is not just for you to hear from us, but for us to hear from you. And I, I look forward in the few minutes that we have here this morning uh, having a chance to hear from you a bit and in the months in ahead to work together uh, to develop a relationship uh, so that we can make more progress on these important issues. Why don't I stop there and take a few questions. Um, I know it's a full program, and um, uh, but it, I'd love to just have a little bit of back and forth. So uh, why don't I, with the lights, I can't quite see. Yeah. Um, I'm Barb Coppins, I'm from New Jersey, and um, I'm a self-advocate, and I represent other self-advocates from New Jersey on these issues and concerns for people with developmental disabilities, and such as employment and community living and other, um, like Medicaid, Medicare, and all that. And, um, and I get right on with the action, you know. Uh, when I receive these community, um, these capital insiders, I take action right away, I do. And I writing letters to my Congress and the Senate, and then I get response back from them. So I have like a stack of letters that I receive from the Congress and also from President Obama. You know, I've written a letter to him. And, um, and my um, group member is that I'm the president of the New Jersey Statewide Self-Advocacy Network. We do um, an activity and we write letters to our um, the president and our Congress about the issues and concerns for people with disabilities. But employment is one of the key that needs a lot of attention because, because people with um, IDD should be out there in the community and uh, working and uh, because there are people like everyone else. So um, also what the gentleman had said before that I like to see people uh, working at the White House because I think it would be a great opportunity for them and that's why yes. well, Thank you. I, I, I think that the, we are totally agree that employment is critically important. It's important uh, uh, for the obvious reasons that people uh, need to support themselves. It's important to be part of the community with the full access to the opportunities to be a part of the community. So we, ne we need to make more progress in that area. I said to the other self-advocates, you gotta get out there yeah. and have your voices heard out there. You know, you gotta step up to the plate and all that. And you have to advocate for yourself. That's right, and that's what I, I always tell them. So that's why I'm always out there a lot. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Peter Burns. I'm the CEO of the ARC, and I'd like to really thank you first for taking time out of your schedule to be here, be here with us today. Um, and also ask, though, um, Medicaid is certainly a lifeline for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Let me, let me ask, what more can we do as a community to support the administration in preventing the dismantling of the Medicaid program? I think that um, Medicaid is one of the most important programs that we have uh, in 
the federal government. It, it is the difference between life and death and between uh, being able to continue uh, with an independent life or not for so many. Um, there have been efforts over the years to fundamentally change Medicaid. I think the president has made clear that he is against any of these discussions of things like block granting or changing the basic structure of the program. You know, we have taken some positions that have been a little bit controversial where we've said we do have to tighten up in some places. And I think that there's a difficult balance between when you care deeply about a program trying to, to, to address some of its problems and attacking it in a way that makes it not serve those purposes. Um, I hope that we're in agreement more often than not, almost always. Um, I think your voices need to be heard. I, I think that um, there's the notion that somehow uh, Medicaid is a wasteful program when in fact the reimbursement rates are low, the access to service is not yet where it should be, um, but at the same time, the costs are growing rapidly. There is, I think, a broad misunderstanding about what drives Medicaid. Uh, I think that it's thought of as a program um, that has different characteristics than it really has. Uh, when you confront people about where the drivers of Medicaid costs are, and they realize that it's long-term care, and it's senior citizens getting long-term care that's really driving the cost of the program, it does make them take a step back, and we make that case on a regular basis. I, you know, there's no question but that health care costs overall are something we've got to get our hands around. Uh, that was what the Affordable Care Act was about. Uh, that's what so many of the things we're working on are about. But it is not acceptable to take the people who are most in need and put them more in jeopardy, and that's something we've tried to resist, and we're going to continue to resist, and we appreciate your help in that up on your comment about health care reform. I'm Holly Lou Conant-Reese from Tennessee. I'm the mom of a 28-year-old young man um, who has a developmental disability and his own lawn care business. We celebrate health care reform. Um, he, uh, we structured our family finances so that he is a tax-paying citizen. Um, his, so he is not financially eligible for Medicaid. Um, his health care premiums cost him $12,000 a year. What do I say to him um, when he tells me he's afraid he's going to go bankrupt? Well, um, obviously the, the challenge of paying for health care is a great one, and that's one of the reasons the Affordable Care Act was so important. Um, we're now in the implementation phase. It's not yet there for people to take uh, the benefit of. But when it is in place, it will greatly expand the amount of support that people for whom the premiums are an obstacle to coverage um, face. Um, that's why we had to fight for the Affordable Care Act. It's why we have to defend the Affordable Care Act. And it's why we have to resist efforts to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we're on a path now where in a year or two, I'll be able to answer your question saying that there's a f network out there and a, and, a, and a net that is, is going to work. Um, and we can't let that be challenged. Um, you know, we've made enormous progress getting the policy in place. We now have to implement it. I think I have time for one more. Yes. Um, I would like, I'm Kevin Smith from West Virginia. And I would like to challenge you to look at the SSI laws because when you go out to work, you can make $65 before they start cutting you for everyone you make. Now, we both know if more people with disabilities are out there working, there's more money going in taxes and more people will benefit. But that $65 and take two for everyone you make, that don't give people with disabilities incentive to even get out of bed. So 
I appreciate the comment. Obviously, uh, it, 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 is, uh, it is our goal for there to be incentives for people who are able to, to work. Um, it's our goal to treat people fairly. These f rules that you're describing have been kind of long established, so I don't want to suggest that there are things we can go back and just, in this environment, um, make great changes in right now. But our goal is that work should be rewarded and work uh, should be attractive and there should be an incentive for work. So I thank you for your, for your comment. Thank you all for being here today and it's great to be with you. So um, I, I, you probably all can tell, but um, uh, the, the community of people with disabilities could not have a greater champion in the chief of staff's office than, than Jack. I've known him for 20 years and he cares very deeply about all these issues. So, um, um, I'm happy to take more questions, budget or anything else. Um, I apologize in advance, I, I have to go at 10 o'clock sharp, so I'll try to do as many as I can. Yes, ma'am. I take it you're here with the Stanley County in North Carolina, and I have a question about Head Start. All the literature says that Head Start is not effective. It's been saying that for the last 10 years. Why are we then still doing Head Start the way we've always done Head Start and allocating more money to it? Um, appreciate the question. Um, I think we, we don't agree with either part of your characterization. I think on whether or not Head Start works. Uh, I think what the research shows is that it has a very significant effect Initially, it lasts a couple years, and then in terms of academic effects, that fades out. But if you look longer term, if you look at what happens to kids who've been in Head Start and been in really good early childhood programs 10, 15, 20 years later, you see lasting effects. You see impacts on earnings. You see impacts on levels of teen pregnancy. You see impacts on whether kids are in prison or not. So I think you do see effects. The part of what you said that I agree with is that programs vary a lot in quality. Head Start programs vary a lot in quality. And this administration has been very strongly committed to doing tough stuff to improve the quality of Head Start. The very best Head Start programs are wonderful. The not so good Head Start programs are not. And we should be doing more to change those programs. So one of the things we've done is say that for the first time in decades, um, many programs that have had their grants just renewed as a matter of course have to compete for those grants. And about a third of Head Start programs are going to be subject to competition. So one of the things we would love to see is more of the really good programs going out and saying, we want to grow, we can do better, we can serve more kids well. So um, we really are committed to increasing the number of kids in, in early childhood education, but just as important, improving the quality of early childhood education. So thanks for the question. Um, yes, sir. More of a big picture question. You were talking about the, you know, budget deficit that we face and uh, the importance of revenue. Maybe to help us understand it better, sure. if we were able to get some revenue, you know, uh, initiatives passed. Yeah. What do you think, from your perspective at OMB, you know, how would that help deflect, you know, deflect some of the targets on the deficit? Because clearly the programs you're proud of, you talked about, are the ones at risk, right? Discretionary. Uh, so if you could. Give us a sense of how that could help forestall some serious cuts to the yeah, program. It's, it's, it's a great point. I, I think our view is that we will not deal with the country's long-term deficit challenges unless we get more revenue. We just won't. Nobody is eager to raise taxes. Nobody wants to. Nobody wakes up in the morning saying, "Boy, I really want to raise taxes." But if we are going to meet our country's challenges, we have to get more revenue and. Uh, if we're going to get more revenue, we need to start by asking the people who are doing best off, people who are paying much less now than they were paying in the 1990s when the country was doing just fine. Um, and I think if we can get reasonable levels of revenue, get, get and we talked about it in our budget last year, we will talk at it, about it again in our budget this year. If we can do that, I think we will be able to do two things. One is, as you said, replace this coming automatic cut, which would just be extremely destructive for Head Start, for, um, for an enormous number of programs, um, and two, deal with the deficit. So I think to do both of those things, uh, uh, revenue is absolutely critical. Uh, yes, ma'am. Make the 
able to really do that? Yes. I think we think that braiding funding streams is critical. We have tried very much to connect up um, when you're dealing with younger children to get to, to, to break down barriers, say, between education funding streams and social services funding streams and to bring the departments of education and HHS closer together. When you're dealing with young adults or adults, we talk a lot about better connecting um, uh, voc rehab programs that sit at the Department of Education with job training programs for individuals with disabilities at the Department of Labor. There's, what we try to do is look at these systems from the perspective of not us as, as uh, people in government who know the boxes, but from the perspective of a human being out there in America who's trying to make their life better and doesn't really care what department a program is, but is, is just looking for the right set of services. And chances are what they need uh, is not just something that sits in one little box, but they may need a range of services and we need to be able to provide that range in a unified way. Hi, um, I'm Erin Hall from Fort Worth, Texas. I'm a proud taxpayer and a uh, proud Texan, even though historically uh, my state hasn't um, competed for um, some of these programs, uh, to, you know, in times past. So yeah. do you have any creative, maybe out of the box ways that specific communities in these difficult states um, could implement some of these programs or make, create some of these partnerships? So, yeah, so I, I, I know what you're talking about. And, um, I love my state. I just want to say that this is live and I um, really do. We, um, and, 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 and we love your state too. Um, um, one of the things that we have tried to do, we did this in the Recovery Act, um, and uh, we're going to do it again in Race to the Top this year, is to create a, a world where we can to say, you know what, we want states to apply, because usually the state, in a lot of cases, the state's best position to, when we talk about something like braiding funding, they're the right entity to do it. But if a state doesn't want to apply, we like to try to create a mechanism for, for a locality to apply. Um, and um, so, for example, in Race to the Top, um, for the first two years of the program, only states could apply. We worked very hard this year in the appropriations process to create an option for districts to apply. And we actually were willing to say, you know what, we'll take a little bit less money overall if we can get districts into the game. And so I think what that will mean in a state like Texas is that even if the state isn't interested, if a Dallas or a Houston or an El Paso wants to come in, they can. Um, um, uh, setting, uh, and setting any of these resources aside specifically for IDD because as, a, as an issue, I've worked in many um, areas of social services and as an issue, this really is incredibly invisible. I mean, our yep. battle is so uphill, it's not even funny. I, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here. To but. Totally agree. I think what we, what we will try to do is either have a set aside or have requirements baked into the grant that say you have to address challenges, needs of, of IDD. Uh, so one way or the other, we'll do it. I have time for only one more question. Yes, sir. Rick Swart from New York State. Recently, uh, Congress directed CBO to change the way it reports out its evaluation of legislative budget bills. Um, and there, I'm not going to get into the details, but you probably know me better than I do. Uh, will that substantially change how we advocate on behalf of legislation? There's a lot of legislation that is trying to change the way that CBO reports. I'm not sure. There was some stuff in the Budget Control Act. I, so I'm not aware of any major changes that have been enacted. I, I will say there's a lot of legislation on the Hill right now that would change the way CBO scores things and reports on things. Um, there are pieces of that legislation that we support, like there's a measure to make it easier to eliminate wasteful spending that we like. A lot of that legislation would be destructive. Uh, in many cases, I think people are trying to tell CBO using what appear to be technical changes to put a thumb on the scale against a lot of really critical investments in the future in kids, in people. 
Um, and so you can have a very technical issue that actually has a very real human impact. So I think keeping an eye on those kinds of bills, we keep a close eye, and I think for advocates to keep a close eye is a good thing. So I'm sorry to have to go. Thank you all very much. It's great to see you. So we are waiting for Mr. Perez, who seems oh, Tom is here. We were I was just about to talk about you and say you were lost in the building. <laughs> yeah, well, all right, okay. <laughs> Please ask Tom lots of hard questions. Okay, so give us a give us a give us a second here. Um, give us give us two minutes. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Great to be here. Uh, this is, I, it feels a little bit like old Holmes Day for me. I see a lot of familiar faces in this audience, and uh, I want to thank you for your remarkable uh, activism and energy. Uh, moving the ball forward on civil rights is about persistence. It's about never giving up, and uh, I learned that from my uh, former boss, Senator Kennedy. I learned that from my current boss. Eric Holder and Barack Obama, and frankly, and for, uh, for, uh, most importantly, I learned it from uh, so many of you who have uh, been such leaders in the disability rights movement. Uh, my name is Tom Perez. I have the privilege of serving as the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights in the Department of Justice. Uh, this, I'm a recidivist. This is my second tour of duty in the department. I was there uh, for the better part of a decade. Uh, starting in 1989 and uh, left uh, to actually go over to work with Donna Shalala uh, for the last two years of the Clinton administration working in the Office for Civil Rights as the director. And so uh, I've met some of you in that capacity. I've met some of you in my current capacity. And uh, it is an honor uh, to be doing the work that I do. And I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, what we're up to. Uh, Eric Holder, our attorney general, often calls the uh, Civil Rights Division, uh, one of the crown jewels of the Department of Justice. And, and those, the crown jewels are actually the laws that we enforce, uh, one of which is uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And what I love about the ADA, and I suspect you love as well, is that it has really uh, facilitated a paradigm shift across this country. Because for all too long, the question that got asked was, what can't people with disabilities do. And what the ADA does is it says, what can people with disabilities do? And what should we be ensuring that people with disabilities can do? And that's precisely what we have been doing uh, in the department. Uh, I'm very proud of the dedicated career professionals that have really done remarkable work enforcing uh, the ADA in a number of areas. Uh, we celebrated the 20th anniversary, and a number of you uh, were here for that, uh, the ceremony on a beautiful uh, July day with the president uh, right here. We issued uh, the most sweeping uh, set of new regs at that time since the uh, initial enactment of the ADA, and those have been very transformative. Uh, through our litigation, we have been able to continue uh, quite literally and figuratively to open up doors and break down barriers. Uh, in communities across the country. 
Uh, we, don't mat we don't count our success simply by the number of pieces of litigation we bring. Uh, we have a very active and aggressive program of technical assistance that has been very successful. We have our project Civic Access that ensures that communities are accessible. So when I go down to Alabama and I'm talking to uh, disability rights activists and they tell me, uh, you know, I wanted to go down to uh, the state capitol to uh, protest, but I couldn't get into the building because it wasn't accessible. Uh, that's not right. And that's why we need uh, to continue in a wide array of areas. And the area I want to focus on uh, in the uh, time that I have with you is the work we're doing uh, in the Olmstead area because I'm very, very proud of that work and I'm very, very proud of the partnerships with many people in this room uh, and across the country. That applause really should be for yourselves and for the advocacy that you have done because uh, it has truly been uh, remarkable. I was working for Secretary Shalala uh, when the decision came out. Uh, some of you may know my good friend Bob Williams, uh, who is an icon in the movement and a very close friend. And Bob and I were the uh, Secretary's uh, uh, brain trust, if you will, on uh, Olmstead issues. And I remember the excitement that we all felt uh, the date of the decision. We all thought that this is going to be the Brown versus Board of Education uh, of the disability rights movement that would really catalyze uh, movement of, of, of eligible people away from institutions and into community-based settings. And, uh, you know, the similarity with Brown, uh, regrettably, was that uh, this transformation has uh, regrettably occurred with all deliberate speed. Uh, it hasn't quite uh, gotten the pace uh, that uh, we all would want it to have. Uh, and that's why when we came in uh, and when this president came in, uh, we made the enforcement of the Olmstead case uh, a top priority. And you've heard from Kareem Dale this morning. Kareem has been a remarkably important ally in this. We've gotten so much support here uh, from the White House, starting with the president, but going through so many different layers and levels of support here at the White House. And uh, we have a remarkable staff in the division, and we have really uh, turned around, I think, a program. And you look not only at the quantity of work that we've done, but at the quality of work that we've done. Uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, I was in Virginia announcing our most recent uh, landmark settlement, which was, um, I think, a fantastic uh, example of partnership. And I want to start out by thanking you. Uh, and I also would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, Governor McDonnell, who was uh, a very critical partner in this enterprise. We spent very little time debating the existence of a problem in Virginia, uh, and we spent the overwhelming bulk of our time solving the problem and doing so in a nonpartisan fashion. Because Olmstead is not about Republicans and Democrats. It's about people who want to live in the community and, in, and can live in the community with the appropriate supports. And so uh, I really want to talk a bit about what we did in Virginia because it's our latest uh, work and it's some of our best work, I believe, thanks in no small measure to the dogged advocacy of many people in this room. So uh, as you know, it's going to shift. It's really going to be a paradigm shift. And uh, that's really what the agreement will do, because it's going to shift the um, uh, Virginia's developmental disability system from one that's heavily reliant on large, expensive, state-run institutions into one in which we really have uh, a focus on safe and individualized and cost-effective community-based services that promote integration, they promote independence, and they enable individuals to live, work, and participate fully in community life. I always say that um, in this work, and, and we've been able to work uh, successfully with Republican and Democratic governors on remarkable systems change. I met with Governor Sonny Perdue shortly after I started. He's, he was the governor of Georgia at the time. He, uh, was, uh, he was reaching the end of his term, so he's no longer the governor of Georgia. We had a remarkably productive discussion. And the reason we were able to reach an agreement there after so many years of seemingly um, fruitless uh, uh, litigation back and forth. And the reason we're able to reach an agreement with Virginia without having to have the protected uh, litigation is because this is a threefer, I call it. Because when you transform your system, you are satisfying your legal obligations under the ADA. 
You're satisfying your moral compact with people with disabilities who can and want to live and thrive in community-based settings, and you're satisfying your fiduciary obligation to the taxpayers because it makes no sense to spend in uh, the state of Delaware, for instance. They were spending over $200,000 per person uh, in, in the context of people who had serious mental health needs. Uh, and none of that money was getting reimbursed because it was state-only dollars. And now, as a result of our settlement with the state of Delaware, you can serve people in the community for about $40,000, $45,000, half of which is reimbursed by Medicaid. So this is sound moral policy, it's sound civil rights policy, and it's sound fiscal policy. And that's why we have been able to work with uh, governors across the ideological spectrum who understand that this is truly uh, an investment in so many uh, different ways. We worked very hard in Virginia, and we spent a lot of time on the nitty gritty because the nitty gritty is so important. Because we wanted to learn, and we have learned the mistakes and lessons of history. If you simply uh, open up institutions and move people into communities without the adequate supports, without the adequate quality control, you're simply going to repeat the mistakes of history. And we have so many systems in place in Georgia, Virginia, and Delaware to prevent history from repeating itself. So in Virginia, for instance, the agreement expands or strengthens every aspect of the Commonwealth system for serving people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We have about 3,000 new waivers for individuals with uh, intellectual disabilities that are on the urgent wait list and youth and in with intellectual disabilities who are in private institutions. 450 waivers for individuals with other develop developmental disabilities on the wait list and youth with other developmental disabilities who are in private institutions. Another 800 waivers for individuals transitioning out of the state-operated uh, training centers. We also have supports because what we heard a lot was that um, if I can get respite care, if I can get uh, support for three, four hours a day, uh, a few days a week, uh, we can make it work at home. And so there are family supports to a thousand more individuals uh, who are on the wait list so that they can provide care in the family home and present and prevent the unnecessary institutionalization. We also learned a lot from many of you here that we, we have situations where we must have uh, uh, crisis prevention systems. And so uh, the agreement provides for crisis services that will help divert individuals from unnecessary institutionalization and keep them in their communities. We have a, an integrated housing fund because we recognize that uh, housing is a critical barrier to uh, giving full force to the Olmstead decision. We have provisions in the Virginia Agreement about integrated employment and development and implementation of an employment first policy that prioritizes integrated uh, competitive wage supported employment for individuals that are receiving state funded services. I've heard from so many people with disabilities who tell me, I want to be a taxpayer. There's not too many people that you hear from that say, I want to be a taxpayer. But that's what we hear. And that's what we want to try and do here in this. We have uh, case management systems. We have community quality assurance because that is so critical. I have spoken with a number, and, and our team has spoken with a number of, of parents of people who are uh, living in the training centers, and they're very concerned. And, and I, I very much respect the concern that they have because uh, they're wondering what sort of quality control will be in place when you move into decentralized settings and communities. And that's a very fair question. And that is why we spent literally four months negotiating about quality assurance. Because if we cannot look you in the eye when we're preparing this move and say, your child or your adult or your loved one is going to be safe and is going to be thriving in the community, uh, then we can't make this happen. And that's why we spent so much time on quality assurance. And, uh, and that's why uh, we have a monitor who has remarkable experience. He's worked in an institution. He's worked in um, uh, programs that are community-based. And he is going to be uh, someone that everybody will call on. Uh, the Virginia settlement built on the Georgia settlement. And I'm very proud of the Georgia settlement, which was also involved people with um, developmental disabilities and people 
uh, with uh, mental health issues. And, and uh, frankly, uh, when we were talking about Georgia and when we've been doing work in the mental health setting, uh, some of our biggest allies have been uh, law enforcement because uh, one of the largest facility, one of the largest mental health facilities in the United States is the LA County Jail. I was with Sheriff Baca just uh, a week ago uh, at a conference. And because our, our system is so broken, our community-based mental health infrastructure, uh, all too frequently the options are the emergency room or, or the jail. And that is uh, a terrible set of options. And that's why uh, in Georgia, I'm very excited about the work that we're doing in the mental health context. And similarly in Delaware, uh, uh, the governor there was a remarkably important and valuable partner. And so we've made really, really big progress there. Uh, but our work isn't over. We have so many other places where we are doing work. Uh, many of you may have seen a findings letter that we issued uh, shortly before uh, the Christmas uh, holiday in Mississippi. Uh, if any of you are from Mississippi, you will know that Mississippi is one of the most institutionalized states in the country. We've had a lot of cooperation in the course of our investigation, and I enter the next phase with a real sense of optimism. I'll say this about Mississippi. They're leaving a lot of money on the table right now because they're eligible for all sorts of enhanced matches. And in the course of working on cases like um, Mississippi and, uh, and Georgia and elsewhere, uh, we spend a lot of time with Cindy Mann. I know you heard from Cindy uh, maybe an hour ago. Cindy's brilliant. And Cindy has been uh, a very, very important partner. Uh, one of the questions that I heard people ask before was about stovepipe implosion. A big part of our work is just that because we recognize that if we're truly going to make this work, and it's not simply about where people live, but it's about how people live. If we're gonna make this work, we've gotta work in tandem with HHS to follow those funding streams and make sure we reverse the institutional bias that all too frequently prevents the expansion of community-based services. If we're gonna make this work, in places like North Carolina and elsewhere where we have active investigations, we have to work with HUD because there are deficits in uh, housing in the communities, especially if you look at Western North Carolina and you see uh, more rural areas. And if we want people with disabilities to return to their communities, we have to work closely with HUD. We have to work with the USDA who actually has a number of housing programs that some of you may be aware of. We have to work with the Department of Labor because we want to make sure that uh, employment opportunities are robust and abound. And we are actually working quite closely now with the Department of Veterans Administration, uh, Veterans Affairs, because we recognize that we have so many uh, veterans, especially those uh, returning from uh, the various conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq who are confronting uh, TBI and other uh, serious disabilities, and we want to make sure that we provide for them uh, the opportunities that they are entitled to. And so our stovepipe implosion initiative is in full force. We're working together with all of those agencies. We're working together with states. And I, again, I applaud Governor McDonnell for his work. I applaud Governor Perdue. I applaud uh, Governor Markell in uh, the state of Delaware. And it has been remarkable. We've also been working with many uh, advocates across the country. Our amicus practice, uh, coming in, filing statements of interest and other briefs in cases that are very important. Uh, that continues to be uh, robust. And we're not simply involved uh, in cases that involve state institutions. We're also working in uh, other matters. So for instance, uh, we intervened in a lawsuit in Texas involving uh, a, a, a private case uh, that with involving individuals with disabil developmental disabilities who are in nursing homes. We also um, have a lot of cases involving, uh, an increasing number of cases involving children uh, who want to live in the community and can live in the community with the appropriate supports. Uh, somebody asked the question, how do you do more with less in um, tough budget times? And we've also been involved in litigation challenging states' cuts to community services that put individuals who are currently in the community at risk of unnecessary institutionalization. We filed a successful brief in a case in um, uh, California in that regard. We've uh, been filing, we've spent a lot of time in Illinois, our statement of interest including 
uh, supporting private litigation there regarding people in or at risk of entering private facilities uh, for individuals with disabil developmental disabilities. Again, uh, so many leaders in uh, the community there, and we want to make sure that uh, we're there uh, supporting these efforts. Because we can't do this alone. You can't do this alone. Our partnership is the embodiment of synergy. And that is why I spend so much time on the road, because I don't know what I don't know. And I can tell you that so many of the cases that we have brought, so many of the initiatives that we have undertaken have been the result of listening sessions. Uh, so that I go out, we listen, we learn, and we act. And that is why uh, we are, we've had something like 35 different matters in about 2021 20, states, and that number continues to expand. We had a letter of finding in North Carolina, which I mentioned, and we're actively working with them. And we're working in a very collaborative fashion. I want to applaud uh, the governor and uh, the new acting secretary, uh, Al D'Elia, in North Carolina. We've been working very uh, well with them. We have a letter of finding in New Hampshire. So it's north, south, east, and west. It's all across the country because the issue is all across the country. And we will continue to work uh, vigilantly because this is indeed so important. This is really about freedom and opportunity. We're in the opportunity business in the Civil Rights Division. We expand through our enforcement of our employment laws. We expand the opportunities to earn through the enforcement of our uh, education laws. We expand the opportunities to learn through the enforcement of the ADA and other disability rights laws. We expand the opportunity for everybody to live a life of freedom and opportunity. And that is why I'm here today to say thank you, to outline what we're doing, and to say, while I am very proud of what we did in Virginia, Georgia, Delaware, and elsewhere, we are not resting on our laurels. We've got a lot of work to do. I feel an acute sense of urgency, because everywhere I go, I hear of stories of people in need. I hear stories that require us to do even more. And I hear stories that require immediate action. And that is why we are working so hard and will continue to work so hard, because these issues are so important. And I want to thank you for your leadership throughout, because this truly has been, when I reflect on our priorities in the division, and when I got here, we established, uh, we were, our, our goal was to enforce the laws, all of the laws, and to do so fairly and even-handedly, and that's what we've done. And we paid particular attention to three areas, one of which was our Olmstead enforcement. And I'm happy to report that we have a lot to show, but we have a lot more to do. So I want to stop there, take any questions you have, and uh, again, say thank you to you for your involvement. Yes, sir. I'm Steve Larson with the Ark of Minnesota, and I want to thank you for the work that you do. Thank you, Steve. Uh, as a result of uh, private litigation and Olmstead Commission will be established in Minnesota for the first time. So we'd like to invite you to Minnesota to help us get that uh, commission kicked off sometime in uh, 2012. So we'll be in touch. Please I be in touch. Tom.Perez at usdoj.gov. Write that one down. And if you're uh, watching this live streaming, Tom.Perez at usdoj.gov. I was just in your fine state a week ago today. And uh, I'm, a, I'm from upstate New York, so I don't even bring a coat because it was pretty warm. <laughs> Could you elaborate a little bit more on living wages, employment first, and employment sure. in general for persons with disabilities? Because we have hundreds of thousands of persons with disabilities that are working uh, for subminimum wage. Right. It's a, I mean, you look at the unemployment rate. I, I'm, I'm from Maryland, and before I took, had the privilege of taking this job, I was the labor secretary in the state of Maryland. And uh, the unemployment rate for people with disabilities was north of 50 percent in Maryland. And the underemployment rate was remarkable as well. And so that's why, and you look at the Virginia agreement, uh, every agreement we're attempting to do even more. Um, I'm very proud of the Georgia agreement. We took that Georgia agreement and we're trying to build upon that. And one of the things that we're building on in Virginia is again the employment first model. And we're working very closely with our colleagues at the Department of Labor. Some of you may know a guy named Seth Harris. Seth is the Deputy Secretary of the uh, Department. 
uh, effectively the COO of the Department of Labor. Seth Harris is a remarkable friend and ally of the disability rights community. Uh, Seth and our, uh, he, he is actually has been an architect of uh, our work in the um, employment area, and I've had many conversations with Seth and others. There's a woman in my office that you're going to meet this afternoon, Eve Hill. Eve, is, Eve and Allison Barkoff are um, a big part of our brain trust in the Civil Rights Division. Uh, sometimes you say about a person, uh, you know, Eve, you know, so-and-so wrote the book on this. Eve quite literally wrote the book on uh, disability rights, and uh, it's available at law schools uh, across the country. And uh, her, one of her big areas of focus has been employment, and that's why we are paying such attention to it. What we need is your advice. Uh, because there are a lot of different models, there are a lot of different challenges out there, and uh, we recognize that there's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Part of it is about adjusting attitudes of employers, because uh, I, I know in my work in the state of Maryland that the attitudinal adjustment was critical. Uh, there's, a, there's a movement to teleworking, and that's actually something that can be a boon, because transportation is often a major barrier for uh, people with disabilities. And we worked a lot with employers who had a lot of teleworking employees to um, uh, educate them that uh, individuals with disabilities are their, some of their best employees, potentially. Thank you for your question. Yes, ma'am. With the Arc of Virginia. I, just I know, Jamie. <laughs> we, got, we got our whole Virginia contingent here. Yes, we have a lot of people from Virginia, but I think I speak for also a lot of people in the room from across the country with the precedent that you set in Virginia. Uh, generations of families have fought to break through some of these barriers that you uh, absolutely broke through a couple of weeks ago. And the, the work that was done on the at-risk population and many of us working on waiting list initiatives across the country uh, is just our, our, We value the partnership we are, are, and, and really applaud the diligent protection of the ADA and the enforcement. So we just want to say a big thank you. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. You know, I would uh, love to take uh, more questions. I could take well, one more question, but we have, a, I think, someone else who may be here after uh, I'm done. So I, I will, uh, I have to, uh, I've been told that uh, our next speaker might be here soon. Anyway. And, you know, it's not often we thank public officials, and I do want to thank you for what you're doing to enforce the Olmstead uh, decision. Uh, one of the, we're still too many people living in institutions, and one of the things we hear about is there is some opposition to closure at local community <coughs> levels because of potential job losses that it creates for local communities. How do you deal with that in your thinking and your litigation? That's a great question, and when I was in Maryland, I met a lot with, uh, I have some very good friends, uh, who, were, um, who worked for AFSCME, who represented uh, a number of uh, very dedicated employees who worked in um, uh, an institution in Maryland that we just, uh, that Governor O'Malley just closed, Rosewood. And uh, you know, part of this is that we have to make sure as we build this community capacity that we build living wage jobs in the community, because one of the things we hear time and time again is that uh, the job of people who are working, uh, taking care of people in community settings are not making a living wage. And so I've spent a lot of time working with labor unions and others to talk about how let's turn this into a win-win situation, because uh, this isn't about job loss. This is, let's, we should really look at this as an opportunity to expand a field that is a remarkable growth industry down the road and in the present, and let's make sure that we make it uh, an industry that is a living wage industry that can be a career, because you know far better than me, if, if every nine months you're, you're going through a new uh, attendant, that's just not sustainable for anybody. That doesn't work at all. And so uh, your question is one of the most important questions. Uh, when we were working on Laguna Honda in the Bay Area, that was, that was one of the big issues, and we were able to deal with it. So uh, thank you for your question. And again, thanks to everybody for your advocacy.